Um, okay. Well, hi guys. Thanks for coming. Um, my name is Andrew Weiner, and this is my MMP 495 capstone presentation. Um, to those of you just tuning in, if you could please mute yourself, that would be wonderful. All right. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen, and we'll get started. All right. So this whole semester for my capstone project, I decided that I would do um, a whole album from start to finish, from inception, you know, not having anything written to a full completed product in the course of one semester. And right here is the album artwork that I have chosen, which is a work of art my sister made a few years ago while she was still a student at Ball State. So our beginnings. So this whole project was a collaboration between me and my friend Caleb Johnson, who I hope is here. Um, if he's not, that's fine. We met while we were performing together at Ball State's Jazz Ensemble Number no. 3. Now, when we met, we never really talked at first. The first interaction we ever had was actually after we had first played together. And it was like we just knew each other right off the bat. Um, and just because of that, we knew like almost from the get go that we wanted to make music together. And we've been making music together for a while, but this was the first real project that we ever worked on together. Now, Inception. So Caleb and I met like met for this project when I moved back to Muncie from being at home for the lockdown that happened. So the first time that we actually met together to work on this project was August 21st. We had planned on making a 12 song concept album as quickly as we could. And, you know, I asked him if I could use it for my capstone project. He was like, sure. And so we started working on it and we decided we would have a concept album about space and the cosmos where all the songs are kind of based loosely upon different planetary objects and are each named after something different that involves the universe. So here's my track listing. It goes in order left to right, so Virgo, Beatles, Liner, and so on. So we originally started with 12 songs, but throughout the semester, I decided that it would be best if we cut a couple of the songs because they were just taking longer, and those last two songs, Mars and Ophiuchus, just, they weren't really coming together the way that we wanted to. So we went from 12 songs down to 10. So writing, you know, we met, you know, as I said on the first, time we met was Friday, August 21st. And these are the notes that I wrote from that day that we met. Page one on your left, page two on your right. So I have album ideas, you know, we were inspired by John Coltrane's Interstellar Space and kind of his, not just his music, but also the, his choice of song titles. Cause it goes, you know, Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, and then it goes straight to Leo. And so we thought that that was really cool. And so we decided we would change up where it says album ideas, you know, there's astrological signs, planets, constellations, and we just wanted it to be something where we could each do our own little thing and have different ideas for each song. And so each song is definitely different than the last. And there's a lot of different ideas that we chose and we were working with that we just, in, you know, thought about on this first time that we met. Um, one of them is, you know, it says under the 12 one to two minute songs, it says Alien Speaks um, interludes over the groups. And so I just thought it would be cool to have kind of like an alien sound of someone talking, which ended up getting into um, our song Haiku Take, which I have a vocalist who does a spoken word poem that I tried to put a bunch of filters on so that she sounded like she was kind of talking through a radio as if she was like, you know, ground control to Major Tom kind of sound. And there's a bunch of other different ideas, some that we use, some that we didn't use, like the out of tune piano. We had planned on using and recording Caleb's out of tune piano that he has his, his apartment, but we decided against it. So over on page two, where you can see Virgo and it says first, that was kind of our song choice and our song order. And one thing that we did was our first track is called Virgo because Caleb's astrological sign is Virgo. And the last song is Libra because my astrological sign is Libra. Now, our second song in the album is called Beetlejuice. Beetlejuice, is, it's, it's spelled like that because that's the actual astrological, like the, the cosmonaut, cosmological term, but it's pronounced like the movie Beetlejuice. And we decided we would do a 12-tone row, and we were just picking through different, you know, 
different notes because as a 12 tone row goes, you play one note and then you can't play that note again. So you go through all the other notes in the scale. So we chose through our whole 12 tone row and then we based our whole song off of that. And on the right, you can see some of our different structures in terms of our arrangements of the song where I see drums fade in with the Pardito Alto, which is a drum set groove. And then I have bass fades in, you know, other different concepts that were used in the arrangement in terms of when we went to record. Here's a couple other songs. We have Haya Kutake, which we first incepted on Thursday, August 27th, 2020. And this is a big, huge arrangement of kind of the way that we were able to keep it in our heads and keep it in our hands rather than having to write everything down on actual um, like music paper. Sorry. I'm, the loss for words for that. And so you can see the five over four bars, the six over two. And so one thing that I did was I wrote this out because this is kind of what I was looking at. This was my music that I was looking at when we were rehearsing. And so I wrote five times of the four bars, and then it moves on to six times of the two bars and five times of four, six times of two. And we just repeated that three times. And then there was a break into the bass drum breakdown for quarters. And then, you know, it continues on from there. And this is actually how the song goes. And so something that we wrote way back when, you know, fast forward a month and a half, and it's exactly what we recorded. Now, over on your right, you'll see what says Icarus at the top. Now, Icarus is a far out star that, you know, we just wanted something super far out. And so we wrote a free jazz song. It's really, really free. You know, there's not a whole lot of structure. It's just a lot of, you know, crazy drums, lots of just piano, bass, you know, it just gets in there, it's super experimental, and that's just how we wanted it. This was our fifth song that we wrote, and it's exactly how it is on the album. Now here's a couple more songs, you know, on your left being Cassiopeia, our first recorded song. This was the first song we actually worked on, and we were kind of hitting an impasse as to how we wanted to continue the song, because, you know, we, we had a, a, you know, a part of the song that we had completely written, and we wanted something different, but something that wouldn't be too, you know, too, like, not the same, you know? And so I wrote this hit section out, and I was kind of just, you know, playing around. It was like, okay, well, what would be cool? What would be really, really odd? And so I wrote this, this is, um, I would call that rhythmic notation out, where I have one, and then in parentheses is the number two, and then there's E, and three, and then four, or and then the and before the four in parentheses, which is just, you know, music notation for 16th notes in a bar of 4-4, four, four, followed by three extra 16th notes, which is the 3-16. Now, moving on to Ursa Major. Ursa Major was probably one that Caleb and I would consider to be our most improved song, and that's one you'll hear in a second as our uh, the demo that we recorded for that. And so this is our whole arrangement of the song, you know, drums and bass fade quiet in, and I'm playing in what I would consider 10 and so it, it, you, you can hear it in the beats like every fifth note rather than every fourth note like most pop songs. And then it moves on and then it'll be, you know, 12 measures of the 10 over 8 and then the fast time for the double, which would be 5 over 8. And then, you know, it continues on and then the song finishes. And so here's that recording. Um, it's the demo recording and it was one that we thought was particularly poor before going in and recording. So here that is. So as you can tell, it was definitely a little rocky and I hope that you guys could hear that. Could you guys all hear that? Okay, cool, thank you. But we were recording all this stuff and we were writing all this stuff in my apartment. Now my apartment, it's an apartment. And so me playing drums in my apartment is not, you know, no, it's not gonna happen. So I had a lot of muting on my drums, a lot of different sound absorbers that I could play so that it wouldn't be too loud. And so when you hear that little duh, that's my snare drum sound, rather than being like a cat that you'd hear in a normal pop song, you know, it's, it's really muted. And then the, the cymbal sound that you hear, I have these practice cymbals that have a whole bunch of holes in them. And, you know, they're just used so that I can practice and be quiet without being too loud and without disturbing my neighbors. 
And so that's what Caleb and I were working on. You know, he'd plug his bass into my speaker and we could hear it. And then I would play over it and try to be basically as quiet as I could. And we didn't practice with an actual drum set until we went into the recording session. So there was no actual me playing on drums, like non-muted drums, until the recording session happened. So when we moved on to the recording sessions, I had originally planned for the recording sessions to be on Friday, October 4th and 5th, or I, I believe 3rd or 4th. It was the first weekend of October, the Friday and Saturday. Um, the Friday one happened, and then the Saturday one didn't. Caleb had some involvements with his family that he was unable to make it to Muncie on that following day. So on our first recording session, we recorded six of the 12 songs, actually five out of the 10, my apologies. And so we had to postpone the second session, the second session until the week following. And, you know, they were both good recordings, but I really do believe that we had a very streamlined first session where we got all five songs recorded in the course of like maybe three hours. But then the second recording session took a lot longer. There's a lot of the harder songs, a lot of the songs that we had to rehearse more. And luckily, since the, the second session got postponed, we had extra time to rehearse. And I have to give a huge shout out to Adam Fanassier for being our recording engineer, because without him, you know, those sessions would have been horrible. Me walking back in forth from the booth to hit the record or stop recording button. And I really just got to give a big shout out to Adam. And thank you for being here right now, Adam. So here is my MS Paint model of the MMP recording studios. So it's a big, what I would call a hexagon. And these little, these little um, angled lines are the doors. You can see the little hallways coming in, one from the bottom and one from the side. And so Adam would be below in the, the studio, below where the orange circle and the green triangle are. But in the studio, the purple box, the purple rectangle was me. That was the drums. And that's where I was recording. And that's where I was at for almost the entire studio sessions, both weeks in a row. The blue, Light blue rectangle with the rounded corners was the concert piano. It wasn't an upright, it was a concert grand piano. And that's where Caleb was for a lot of the time because in these sessions, Caleb was playing bass guitar and piano. On one of the, ses on one of the songs that we did, Icarus, we actually both played piano at the same time. And then on another one of the songs, Amuamua, Caleb also played guitar. Now, you guys might be wondering, what this green triangle is and what this circle, this orange circle is. Well, this orange circle, that's where Caleb was sitting. He had a chair there and that's where he was able to sit and record and look at me where he was looking across towards the purple rectangle so we could make eye contact while we were both playing because we didn't have music in front of us. But then the green triangle, that was our room microphone. We had these things called gobos, which are these giant rectangular sound absorbing blocks that we had angled so that, you know, the sound wouldn't, infringe on our microphone placement that was inside of the green triangle. Now, this green triangle was also not only our room microphone, but it was also our percussion microphone on the, um, the track Ursa Minor. You'll hear some what sounds kind of like um, a C drum, where it sounds like waves. It's, it's actually just a rattle. It's like this seed, I don't even know what to call it, like a seed rattle. It's, it's a little handle with these strings on it, and that there's just some dried on seeds. And I just, you know, was shaking it in my hands and the microphone was picking it up. But this was our recording setup. Now, there were some setbacks in our recording and in the, the pre-production. So before the recordings that happened, the first of being obviously uh, COVID-19. COVID-19 not only impacted the way Caleb and I rehearsed, but it also impacted how our microphones were going to be used during our recording sessions. So Caleb and I both had our own individual COVID-19 scares where we had to cancel rehearsals during our writing process because we both thought that at one point or another, okay. each of us had been um, exposed to COVID-19 from other people. So we had to postpone a few rehearsals. We were going from three to five rehearsals a week down to just zero rehearsals during those weeks where we you know, had to wait on getting test results back. So, you know, moving on to number three right here, our microphone shortages. Our microphone shortages were caused by, you know, COVID-19. Whenever another student used a microphone, after it was done being used, it was supposed to go in quarantine for three days. So we had to reserve our microphones beforehand 
And even then, sometimes the microphones were still in quarantine and we were unable to use them because it was kind of like a first come first serve deal on the microphones. And so for our first recording sessions, the microphones that we used on the piano were actually the same microphones that we used as overheads for the drum set. So the microphones that were just above me while I was playing were the exact same microphones that Caleb used on the piano, which led to a couple interesting things on one of the songs, Beetlejuice, there was actually no overhead drum set microphones, which you know, was a bad thing in terms of mixing, but luckily we had an extra microphone that was sitting off to the back that just ended up getting a great cymbal sound. And so it turned out all, all right, but you know, things happen. And it was just good that we were both flexible and that Adam was able to help us with all these recordings. So recording session postponements, there were a couple times in our recordings and even before then where we had to postpone actually finishing the songs. On the song Cassiopeia, it was the very last song we ever recorded. And the only thing that we actually recorded on our two major session days were the drum set recordings. So I recorded drums on those days and I just shipped them off to Caleb and Caleb was able to re-record and record over it his bass, his bass guitar and um, some synthesizers. And luckily we were able to do that because if we had to go back into the studio, it was just gonna be you know, a huge hassle. But you know, setbacks happen and you just gotta be ready for them. So mixing, I use Pro Tools, Pro Tools 12, Pro Tools Ultimate, whatever you wanna call it, I use Pro Tools. That's the, the software that I used and that was the only software that I used in the mixing process. And I will say that it's not user friendly at all, but you know, when it's the industry standard, you just kind of have to force yourself to go and learn it and you just gotta get good at it. Because if you're not good at it, you know, you can use a different one, but if you're trying to go out into any other studio, Pro Tools is the way to go. So here's a, a snapshot of my mixing screen. This is actually from the song Libra. And so you can kind of see how it looks. It's pretty boxy. It's not, it doesn't look that appealing to use. But in my processes of mixing, I did a couple different interesting things. One of the things that I did, you can see over on your left where in the highlight, it says OHL and OHR in the yellow. And so one thing that I did with those, I put an EQ on them. And so this is getting into some of my techniques with mixing. An EQ is an equalizer, so you can, you can attenuate different volumes of different frequencies of whatever that you've recorded so that, you know, if it sounds too bright, you can cut the highs. If it sounds too thuddy, you can cut the lows and you can get it, you know, just the way that you want it. So one thing I did with those overheads is that I sent them pre-fader. So moving on to this next slide, these are the faders. This is the other mix window that you see when you're using Pro Tools. And so you can see, Right here where my, my mouse is, it says overhead left and overhead right. And right up here where it says reverb and how it's in blue, that means it's sending pre-fader. That means before the sound it gets in to that fader, that line right there, it'll go over to this reverb track right here. And then this will send straight out into your stereo mix while you still have you know, the audio coming in from your overheads. And so I was able to put a reverb on that to make these, these uh, drums pop just a little bit more because one thing with this song Libra, which is the last song that you'll hear today, I mixed it and it sounded good, but the drums seemed really dry compared to the way that the, the, the piano and the bass sounded. So I added a little bit of reverb on there just to bring it forward a little bit more and to have it a little more body and a little livelier. And that overhead, I only put it on the, or the reverb, I only put on the overheads and it really helped a lot. So another thing I did, is right here you can see overhead compressor and it says overhead compressor these three tracks are all sending to this track right here the overhead compressor so i put a devil lock devil lock is like a um a distortion filter so i was able to bring it up i was able to make it crunchier do whatever i wanted to it make it you know lighter in sound make it darker in sound and then i put a compressor on it after so that all the louds were at the same volume that the lows were and all the lows at the same volume that the louds were you know make it sound a lot more even and all this was getting sent over to the bus compressor. So one thing that I used on this track specifically was I wanted everyone to sound like when they were listening to sound like they were sitting at the drums, that they were playing the drums themselves. So I've kind of panned everything, you know, in the stereo mix so that it sounds like you're sitting at the drums yourself. Because, you know, as a drummer, I really want my mixes to sound like I'm playing the drums. And so that's one thing that I wanted everyone to be able to experience too. And so that's what these little knobs are is able to get everyone, you know, 
sound like they're the ones sitting there playing the drums themselves. Now, moving on, on my track, uh, Cassiopeia, and especially Venus, I use what's called the Mugger Fugger. The Mugger Fugger is a ring modulator that you can see right here on your screen, and it works in this manner. So the drive is how much of the signal that you want into the mix. So if like into this filter, if you want it all the way up, if you want the whole thing to be running through the Mugger Fugger, then that's fine. And so that's what I did. I had everything going through this filter. And so you could see these different knobs right here. It's like, okay, well, what are those? Well, on this side, you see the amount. That's the amount that you want that this frequency, this is a sine wave versus a square wave. This wave is, is a lot smoother. That's how much and how fast this rate is how fast you want those um, waves to occur. Because this basically takes your sound going from uh, and puts a lot of vibrato on it. So it goes woo, 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 that sort of deal. And so this ring modulator, is okay, so a ring modulate, it's modulating how much, how the reverb is. And so I didn't want it to be too bright and I didn't want it to be over the top either. So I definitely adjusted the mix down so it wasn't too loud. And I had it going on the high frequencies right here. And this is picking out which frequency you actually want. And so you can get, you guys will be able to hear that sort of deal in Virgo or not Virgo, Venus, especially if you guys got headphones on, you'll see, and it sounds kind of like as if you're in a, a sea, almost almost as if you're swimming. And that's just how I wanted it. And this thing definitely helped a lot with that. So right here is a screenshot of the song Cassiopeia. And a lot of these tracks right here, it's the same track. You know, we recorded it as one signal right here and one signal right here, where I had a left and right, and I had to duplicate it to give it a whole lot of body. And it's the same thing over here. You know, they're duplicated. It's a left and a right track that I ended up having to duplicate below this just so that I could have things with a lot of body. Because one thing with this song, Cassiopeia, we were playing the name along the um, idea of a Casio keyboard. One thing that I had, and one thing that is on almost every track is my Yamaha Tone Bank from the 1980s. Now it's similar to a Casio keyboard, but it's a Yamaha. And so we thought it was a cool little play on words, Cassiopeia, Casio keyboard, you know, using these cool little synth sounds from the eighties and stuff. And a lot of these, like this organ sound, that's just, you know, it's a straight organ sound from that Casio keyboard, or Yamaha Tone Bank. While this keyboard right here, it's actually a harpsichord sound that we used. And we pre-programmed everything. I just put a lot of different effects on it to get it to the way that it, it sounds. But one thing when recording those, it's really weak. And so I had to double the tracks just to make them sound nice and heavy and full because I didn't want them sounding weak because it sounds like, it just sounds, you know, eh. And I didn't want it to sound, eh. I wanted to have a big body so that, you know, the listener wouldn't get bored. Now, looking at this, you guys might be wondering what these little lines are. Now, this is what's called automation. Automation is basically, I'm telling the computer, hey, at this point where it, go, it starts here, I want it to go down a little bit and down in volume. So I'm basically telling the computer to, hey, listen to me and automate and make this go quiet right here and you know be louder right there. And that's all automation is, but it takes a long time. And you can automate not only the volume, but you can automate, automate the pan. And so one thing that's just here in some of these other songs, you'll hear you know, the keyboard kind of go from one ear to the other and back. And you'll hear it in the vocals on Hayakutake as well, where you heal, where you hear the vocals go from one ear over to another and back. And it's just one thing that I thought would be really cool because when I listen to other people's music, that's one thing that I've noticed a lot. You notice the things that travel in your mixes. I thought that'd be really cool to implement my own music. Now mastering. You guys can see the Spotify logo on here. When I was mastering, I wanted to master it to a specific streaming service, and I chose Spotify. And so some of you guys are wondering, okay, well, what, what actually is mastering? Mastering is when you throw the little sprinkles on top of your cupcake. You know, if the, if the whole song is a little cupcake that's got icing on it, but it doesn't have any sprinkles on it, you just throw some sprinkles on it and just it makes it just that much better. That's all mastering is. But another thing that mastering is, you bump up the volume so that it's loud enough. So that when you go from one song to another, you're not having to boost you know, your volume or cut your volume down. You want it to be the same so that you don't have to mess with it. And so Caleb and I chose to master to the Spotify loudness level, which is negative 14 LUFS. LUFS means loudness units full scale. So I would consider Spotify kind of the industry standard in terms of streaming platforms. Yes, there are other streaming platforms out there, but you know, 
the average person my age who's listening to music is listening to it on Spotify. Yeah, there's going to be those people listening to it on Apple Music and whatnot, but you know, we chose Spotify and that's what I mastered to. And so everything that you hear today is going to be at the same loudness and you shouldn't have to turn your volume up or down for any of the songs. So we did have some setbacks during the whole production process after we recorded. You know, I had to learn some new mixing techniques and that entailed me figuring out how these different little, you know, sound effects worked, how the Mooger Fooger worked, how, you know, and one thing that I used is called the crystallizer. So the crystallizer is a filter that, you know, you'll hear on a lot of the songs that make it sound really spacey and rather than it's a reverse delay. So rather than it being delayed backwards, it, it's delayed forward. So it definitely has a much different sound. And so I had to, I learned techniques on how to mix this into the, the overall sounds so that it didn't sound too, too much and it didn't sound too little. Not only that, I got about eight songs in and I, you know, I was talking to Robert, Dr. Willie, about, you know, some of the songs I've already finished. And he was like, oh, well, you should sidechain compress the drums and stuff. And I was like, oh, whoops. And I realized that I hadn't done that on about eight out of the 10 songs that I had done that I had already finished already. So what sidechain compression is, is you, you, you must, you'll usually see it in its, um, in its most epitomic manner in trap music, where you'll hear the 808, but then you'll hear the, the bass drum come in just above that. And say, like, okay, well, how do they get that? Well, what they do is they take the bass sound and they just duck it right when the kick drum hits. And so I had to go back through, and I did that on all the songs that had drum set on them with a bass guitar. And that was a lot of work. And I just had to make sure everything was, you know, sounding good. And then I had to go back through and I had to master all those songs. So that took a lot longer than it ought to have, but you know, I did it and it took a lot of time, but you know, I still got everything finished. Um, a couple more things that happened were, I'd say specifically technical malfunctions. There were a few times when I went to the studio to mix because I didn't mix it on my laptop. I had, you know, the studio over at um, the music instruction building available to me. There were a few times when I walked in there and I turned on the computer and I had everything pulled up and then I turned up the volume on the um, speakers and I pressed play and nothing happened. Turns out the speakers had somehow disconnected from their receiver and I didn't know how to fix it. And luckily, you know, the next day someone was able to fix it. But at that day, you know, I just, I didn't have anything to do. So I was there just trying to figure stuff out for about half an hour. And then I just gave up and went home and stuff wasn't fixed until the next day. And luckily, you know, it got fixed. Um, you know, there's a lot of other setbacks that happened. Late feedback wasn't always the most helpful because, you know, it's a little late. Post-recording sessions were just, they were always, there was, wasn't anything wrong with them. They were just, it was a little bit of a hassle. And our very last recording session happened the, about two days before all the songs were finished. And Caleb just wanted to go in and you want to re-record his bass drum or his bass solo, bass guitar solo, and just make it that much better. And I was like, okay. And so we went and we did that. But, you know, that's going all the way back to the recording process when I was already almost done mixing that song. And then I had to go and master it. And it's just Little things add up. And when you're trying to get everything done as fast as you can, those little things just, they aren't the most appealing. So I think the biggest and probably coolest thing besides my music on this presentation and this whole project was Robert's involvement in helping me get a collaboration with the Ball State's Charles W. Brown Planetarium. And so the whole idea with this was I have an album about space. The planetarium, all I do is visuals about space. So, you know, why not have a visually coordinated show to my music. And so that's what we did. I got in contact with the visual director and the overall director of the planetarium, Dana Thompson, and the visual specialist, Rachel Williamson. And the three of us were able to come up with a show and Dana Thompson was able to get everything finished and everything worked looking great. You know, you'll see little titles that'll pop up before each song and you know, everything is smooth and coherent and it's just, it's a lovely experience to watch. And this, this picture off to your, onto the bottom corner, that's kind of how it's going to be looking from your perspective today while you're watching your laptops. So here's the little, here's, here's the, the software that they used. I'm not exactly sure how all this worked. Rachel tried to explain it to me and I kind of got the picture, but I know that the right monitor, that's where they would actually pick their visuals. And the left monitor is how they would control the visuals on the overall dome. Now, I didn't know how they recorded this, but I know it, was, it definitely took a lot of time because, you know, visuals always take a lot of time. Editing video takes time. And so I definitely have to give a huge shout out 
to Dana Thompson for throwing in all that work almost at the last minute and for Rachel Williamson putting in a great outline for the entire visuals. So this is a picture of the projector and this is the thing that the computer controls that it, you know, it shows all those pictures up on the dome and that's kind of how you see it right now. Now it's a purple thing and it looks like the craziest camera you've ever seen, but this whole thing is gyroscopic and can turn any way that you want and is probably one of the coolest pieces of technology that I've seen all year. But here is a little video. It's kind of a snippet. It's the outline of the uh, visuals for the song Hayaku Take. And it's a phone recording, but even from my phone, you'll see what it kind of would look like if we were all attending at the planetarium right now. So here's this. And so you can see, you know, we're traveling towards the solar system and you can kind of see the elliptical orbits of the planets and you see this one that's kind of off to the right or the left and that's our comet and you know as we're zooming in you can see the trail of the comet and this is how it would look if we were all attending in the planetarium tonight all right so completion so from inception to completion, this album took exactly three months to make. We incepted the album on August 21st, and we completely finished all the songs on November 21st. So from not having anything on August 20th to having a complete, you know, 25-minute long album, because we did get those extra two songs done that we didn't include, we got everything finished in three, three months. And, it, you know, it feels pretty good, and I think it's pretty impressive that we were able to get everything done as quickly as we were. Because it seems like a lot of a lot of artists in the music industry seem to take like a whole year to get, you know, from writing an album to having it out. And I understand writing takes time, but, you know, it shouldn't take that much time. You can put out 30 minutes in, in complete full song format pretty quick. And that's one thing that I definitely was trying to do with this project. You know, the music was done and it had to be done before the visuals. And so the visuals were done on December 7th and, you know, they look great. And I'm really excited for everyone to see them. And I really do hope that everyone enjoys the show. So some of you are probably thinking, okay, well, when is, it, when is this actually going to release? You know, we're going to have a YouTube show, but okay, when can I listen to it on my own? Well, we have a tentative schedule of a single song will be released on January 2nd, and it should be on all platforms for you to enjoy. Um, and then we haven't quite picked the song yet, so I, I do say tentatively, and then we will have the full album release in later the later part of January. So I do have to give a special shout out to those in attendance today, Caleb Johnson, um, Dana Thompson, Rachel Williamson, Adam Fonassier, Dr. Robert Willie, and those who cannot be here, Savon Pearson. Um, but, you know, Caleb Johnson was my co-composer, co-arranger, the assistant producer and the musician. And, you know, I will have to say a huge thank you to the Charles W. Brown Planetarium and their personnel for being my visual specialists and my visual directors, and Adam for being my lead recording engineer, and Dr. Willie for being my you know, professor, the lead consultant, and you know, just a great inspiration for this, this whole this whole semester, keeping me motivated, keeping me hit my goals, and you know, always keeping me on track. And I was never once late on any of my deadlines, I was always early. I also have to give a huge shout out to Savon Pearson for being my vocalist. She's currently in Atlanta right now, helping, um, hopefully, you know, the Senate elect uh, John Ossoff get elected. All right, so you guys are wanting to view this. So here's the YouTube link for you all to enjoy. I will post it in the chat if this doesn't work, if you guys can't read it. Um, but you can always look it up on YouTube at Planetary Visions Part 1 by Ball State's Andrew Weinert. I will go ahead and stop sharing my screen right now and copy this YouTube link and post it in the chat. So here it is for everyone. Cool. Um, I hope you guys enjoy and, you know, click and watch whenever you guys want. I will be here waiting for you guys to get back. I do suggest using headphones. Headphones are a big Big need. Um, if you don't have them, it's okay. It will be a 360 view in the dome. So I hope you guys enjoy, and I will be here when you get back for a Q&A.
Thank you guys for coming. I appreciate it. Cool. Okay, well, that link is live. If you guys want to like leave the Zoom meeting or if you guys have questions right now, you know, watch it on your own time. It's up to you. You guys have questions? We could do a Q&A first and then do the, the recording afterwards. Can you not broadcast it through here or no? Well, I think it'd be easier if you guys just click on the link yourselves because, yeah, yeah, I could share it through my screen. But I think, you know, everyone, since it's a 360 video, you guys can, you know, click on and move the screen out and around how you guys want rather than me controlling that for you. Because um, it is supposed to be, you know, everyone's own personal enjoyment. If you're on your phone, you can move it around like you're in a window. Yes, that's also true. So if you have it on your phone, you can always just move it around. You don't want to aim it down because you'd be looking at the seats. You want to have it up at eye level or above you to get the full effect. But I do say headphones, headphones, headphones. And if you're on a computer, you can click on the screen and drag it around to, to rotate the view too. You can look up and down and side to side, up and down behind you. It's a virtual 180 degree dome view. Mm -hmm. well, cool. But if anyone has any questions, you know, feel free to ask. I'm right here. I'll be here. You can ask them in the chat. You can ask them right here. What's the video called again? It's called Planetary Visions Part One. Here, I'll copy it right here. Copy this. I'll post that in the chat. And it's posted. There's also that link that I sent to everyone, the YouTube link. If you click on that, you can leave this Zoom meeting and you can watch it for yourself. I'll be here. You know, do whatever you guys want. Yeah, 6.3 thousand views. Yeah, it dropped a few weeks ago. Um, I've had to keep it on the down low so that, you know, a bunch of people didn't, you know, you know, so that people had a reason to come. Um, but, you know, that YouTube link is public. And if you guys want to share it on social media, you know, go ahead. That would be great. If you could just tag me, that would be awesome.